Well, time now to look at the weekend papers and joining me to delve beneath the headlines is the academic Melanie Eusebi. Welcome to the programme. Um, let's have a look at the Shanghai Daily first. The headline yes. there, 60 killed in blast um, at uh, a mosque. Yes. It's, so it says here that the blast hit the mosque in the Shak Shikarpur in the Sin province. So... Um, more than 60 people, 61 people precisely, right in the middle of Friday prayers. And honestly, I, between this and, and, and everything else that's going on in the area, I feel like I'm, it, it's day by day news and I can't actually keep up. It's day by day news. Like bet between the coalition battles, the chemical weapons expert, Egypt being targeted, the U.S. coalition, um, the U.S. led coalition killing um, the weapons expert last week it just feels like there's this hot pot of energy where and and we don't know what's going to be coming next i mean obviously civilians are the ones that are sort of bearing the brunt of um the repercussions as it were from you know political intervention um do you think uh, america and the rest of the coalition are doing enough to um try and get the arab nations on side i I don't know if they're doing enough. I don't actually want to put all of the accountability on America and the rest of the coalition. Do I think they're doing as much as they can to temper and to, um, to negotiate? I don't think so, no. However, um, we can't put all of the blame at their feet. Right now, there are, you know, um, uh, the militant group has taken responsibility. And so you can't put the blame at America's feet or the U.S.-led coalition. I mean, IS is um, it's a, it's a dangerous organisation. It's had a meteoric rise, a bit like Boko Haram. It sort of came out of nowhere. Um, they're not an organisation that have been able to ha you, that the coalition has been able to have any dialogue with at all. They seem to have their own agenda and there's no compromise. We know that, that obviously there are two hostages that they're currently holding. Yes. What's the sort of um, the, the temperament, do you think, um, from both Jordan and also Japan? Because, again, it's, you know, it's a very, very, very delicate diplomatic line that Japan has to tow here. Yes, you're right. And I don't think right now they have much room to play with as well. I don't think there is really much room for negotiation. The last that we'd heard is that negotiations are actually stalled. And that was from the, um, the Japanese uh, reporters. And so there's really, it's the release of one hostage. And if you're, they're not going to do it, then that means that their hostages will be coming on fire. So there, there's no room for negotiation in the, in, under, when you're negotiating for lives, unfortunately. So I don't think that um, we ask, has the U.S.-led coalition or has, um, is there room for negotiation? But I don't think we've left any room for negotiation. I don't think that we are allowing there's room for anyone to do anything at this point. Mm. And it's going, it's a flashpoint. And so uh, I'm, sh I'm sure we're going to see things coming up in the next 24 hours that will shock us because we haven't left anywhere for anyone to go. I mean, but where can people go? We've seen that IS have released videos of, of beheadings. Five videos have been released. And we know also that they've said that the Jordanian pilot is not even, you know, his release is not even on the cards. Um, and as a result, there have been protests in Jordan. Yes, there have been protests in Jordan. But then... Um Again, I think we have to start, it's, it's so hard because we either, we can look at the individual cases and we can look at individual lives, but we have to look at it in the context of the whole area as well. There are so many events that are happening day by day. I can't actually keep up with the news anymore. And so now, um, and so when we're looking to isolate it down to this one event or to isolate it down to these three lives and forgive me for sounding too clinical or too political about it, um, we can't. We can't possibly do that. There is, it's, it's, a, it's a big melting pot and flashpoint right now. And we're, they're exacerbating against one another. They're exacerbating each other. And so I, I'm, I'm actually quite scared, to be fair, because it's going to be it's one little flashpoint. And I think this could be it. And then the whole area explodes. OK, well, let's um, briefly move on to um, the Greek paper. Um, and this is looking at lending. Looking at lending, but it's a, it's classic, isn't it? It's classic. In this case, it's um, the case of a general election. It's the case of internal national politics and then coming into the Eurozone and how do we actually behave in Europe? And so right now, after, you know, Greece, um, Greece has just gone through their general election and now they're saying, you know what, this whole bailout thing, let's end it.
you know what? Yeah, that's a one of, side. A lot of <laughs> analysts in the Eurozone are calling it a, a Grexit. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But the problem is, is that you know what? They there were commitments made by the prior governments, and um, do we honor those commitments? So you know, there there it's a basic balancing act of the national politics versus the international politics. And what sort of impact is this going to have on the rest of us? Well, I think that it's in combination with the quantitative easing movements from last week. I think that there is, um, we'll see that, uh, I think that we'll see, I hate to predict this, but I think that we'll see a um, much more um, involvement from the national governments. And it will not necessarily, particularly for, you know, Italy and Spain, mm -hmm. Greece, we're looking at more involvement from the national governments and the national, um, the national banks, rather than this beautiful, glorious kind of Eurozone that we, per we, we first imagined when it started. Okay, Melanie, thanks very much for your thoughts on the papers. You'll be joining us later in the programme. Thank you. Well, time now to look at the front pages of the newspapers and returning with me in the studio, I'm delighted to say, is Melanie. Um, so what do we have? You've got the British newspaper, The Independent. What's the headline and what's the story? So the CIA did use UK territory for secret terror investigations. Are we surprised? Are we shocked? We are not surprised. The U.S. Senate <laughs> Intelligence Report, it came out last week, but to be honest and to give them their due, Al Jazeera, they reported this a few months ago. And so now with the Intelligence Report coming out and saying blatantly, Diego Guardia was used for um, secret torture interrogations, then it's calling into question this whole U.K.-U.S. relationship. And what sort of relationship do you think that is at the moment? Has it, has it moved on? Has it strengthened? I think that right now it's um, particularly around the island of Diego Gardera that's in this state of renewal. We're about to renew a 50-year deal. We're also in a very key time for national politics where um, our Labour government, Tony Blair in particular, has come under fire in terms of the decisions that he's made around the Iraqi war. And we're also at the time where we're doing, we're having a current election. We're in the current year election, election year this year. So I think that all of these things will come together to actually put um, a, a, a light on or shed a light on what the actual military relationship is between the U.S. and the U.K. How do we go about extracting information from terrorist groups if duress is not used? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Discuss. To discuss. <laughs> How do we? I don't know. I can. I actually. I'm, I'm, I don't know how we would do that. I think that it's not necessarily about how we would or we would not. It's about inform um, information. It's about the British public and the UK public. Um, sorry, the British public and the US public knowing what's happening on these islands mm. and not coming in and really just blatantly lying to us. And then five years later, a report's coming in. You met with 20 diplomats to, in order to redact the report to make sure that we were able to see it. And so really, we're, we're questioning all of, we're questioning kind of the operations of government and how much we actually need to know. So for me to decide whether torture is necessary or not, I don't think that, that's, I don't think this is the primary um, issue here, the primary issue is for that relationship between the US and the UK and how much accountability there is to so their public. Transparency. Publics. Exactly. Okay, well let's move to um, the Borneo post and uh, the story there is about illegal logging but within a protected area. Within a protected area, but let's be fair, Borneo um, deserves to be, the whole area, the whole region deserves to be protected in terms of logging. You know, if you compare it to a similar area, let's just say, you know, the Amazon, right now for Borneo, for Borneo 60 to 250 cubic meters per hectare is logged on a regular basis, where with, Brene um, with the Amazon, we're looking at 23%. So the same measures are not being in place to actually pre um, prepare or um, protect against deforestation. But we also know as well that it's not just, um, you know, local people who are logging um, in order to make a, a living exactly. or in order to survive. It's also run by illicit cartels because illegal wildlife crime, as we know, contributes $20 billion worldwide of which illegal logging is one exactly and so now um not only are they felling trees in a national park they're processing them into sawn timber and so there's just no management of the whole process whether it be the region and what parts of the region we are um, we are actually uh, uh, logging or what we're doing with the products afterwards i so mean i mean protected parks 
should be no-go areas. That's what purists would say. That's what conservationists would say uh, in order to preserve the biodiversity, in order to preserve any endangered species. However, that's unrealistic, isn't it? The, the population, the global population is growing. We all need resources. How do we mitigate against situations like that while still being able to manage the damage that's um, happening within those protected areas. And I think it's key what you said, managing the damage. And so the Amazon is a little bit farther along on that journey. And so that's why you'll see that the deforestation rate is so much lower. However, just due to the rapid industrialization of the area, due to you know the increasing need for palm oil and the other agricultures or the other other um the other agri-industries, mm -hmm. then it's just not being managed at all. And do you think that's because Borneo is so poor compared to the Amazon? Last question. I think it is partly that and also because of its distance as well. Okay. Melanie Eusebe, thank you so much thank for coming you. in. Good to have you. Thank you.